Hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for this unique global webinar on neonatal pain management. I am Dr. Anuradha, a pediatric anesthesiologist and pain and palliative care physician from Indira Gandhi Institute of Child Health, Bangalore. I would like to acknowledge a few facts before we begin this webinar. First of all, our group, the Pediatric Pain Special Interest Group of Asian Society of Pediatric Anesthesiologists, they have given us this unique extend this as per webinars with a pain uh, group. So I would express my deep gratitude to the education committee for the singular honor that they have bestowed on us and uh, the wonderful initiative that they are uh, doing along with this uh, as per webinars the, with the in of disseminating knowledge across Asia and beyond. Secondly, on a lighter note, and to think of it more of like a coincidence, January is the month of kite flying uh, across Asia. And Jan 14th, in, in fact, is being celebrated as the International Kite Day. I mean, for all the PPSIG members, kite has a special meaning for us. Like you can see on my virtual background, you can see a wonderful, uh, colorful kite flowing. So I think, the, which is our logo of PPSIG. And I think today we are truly flying a kite high today. I would request our group's fantastic lead, Dr. Kim Epino, to speak a few words about our group, the Pediatric Pain Special Interest Group of ASPA. Dr. Kim, over to you. Thank you very much, um, Anu. I'm Katharina Epino, so I'm better known as Kim to both friends and colleagues. I'm from the Philippines. I am the current, and in behalf of the ASPA Pediatric Pain Special Interest Group, I extend a warm welcome to all our members and guests, and hopefully soon to be members as well after this webinar. A bit of a background, um, our SIG was launched in November of 2021. It was initially led by Dr. Angela Yeo, who is from Singapore. So the goal was to promote excellence in um, pediatric pain across Asia. And we are a group of like-minded clinicians joined together the common aspiration of increasing awareness on the importance and value of appropriate pain assessment and management in children. We strive to do this with outreach, education, and research. In the process, we also create linkages and establish networks across the globe so that no child is left in pain. So with this, this for a cup of tea, um, I invite you to join advocacy by scanning the QR code flashed on your screens. Upon joining, you will also be given an opportunity to join um, one of our different subgroups, or if, more than one, if you please. So come and hopefully join us. So now, moving along um, to our webinar, our education subgroup has invited an excellent group of speakers for today's webinar. Our moderator for today is Dr. Andy Ade. She is the head of the Department of the Department of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care in Sipto Mangun Kusumo Hospital in Jakarta, Indonesia. She is also the former president of ASPA. She's part of the Commission on Education of the Indonesian Society of Anesthesiology and Intensive Care as well as the Vice Chairman of the Indonesian College of the Shop Care. Aside from pediatric pain, Dr. Andy Addis' um, special interests include pediatric liver transplantation, separation of conjoint twins, airway management, simulation in medical education, as well as emergence delirium in children. I must also say that Dr. Adi has contributed significantly to this PP, to our pediatric pain special interest group in the past two years as subgroup head for education. So thank you very much again, Dr. Adi. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Kim. Uh, we have our four speaker for today. And uh, the rest, Dr. Anu, we will do the uh, housekeeping for this webinar. Dr. Anu, please. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Adi. So we have with us today a 
spectacular lineup of speakers from across the world who are going to take us back to the roots of pediatric pain management right from where it all began. And I think we should start acknowledging that this, this whole pain, uh, uh, pediatric pain as a subspeciality began way back in 1980s when Dr. Anand and his team recognized that neonate pain was felt in the very young and uh, young, young infants and neonates. And this today it has culminated to this creation of this huge speciality that we are so proud to be associated with. So definitely there are a lot of misconceptions and myths when it comes to neonatal medicine. And uh, both, I would say, neonatal placement and management have thus been like underserved and undermanaged. So I do hope in the next one hour, we can provide you some concrete data that you can carry home and hopefully try to implement changes in yourself as well to ensure that no child is left in pain. So before we hand, I hand over the online podium to my esteemed speakers, I quickly run through some housekeeping rules. So this is regarding the Q&A session. We have it at the end of the session. And uh, meanwhile, just feel free to chat in your uh, put your questions or your comments in the Q&A box. Definitely we'll uh, bring up the questions at the end of the webinar. The chat and raise hand function are, however, disabled. Uh, we have a set of questions. We have like four poll questions for you for this webinar. And uh, Dr. Teddy, yeah. So you'll be prompted to answer poll questions when they're launched, and you'll be given 30 seconds to respond and submit your answer. And please do close the poll to view the presenter slides again. Um, and the disclaimer I would say would be like, you know, these are the this is meant the as per webinars are meant for educational purposes only. It's not meant to be like a substitute for professional medical advice or diagnosis or treatment. Uh, at the end of the webinar, by tomorrow, Dr. Teddy and I will send you a webinar survey by around uh, 1700 hours SGT. You can put in your feedback, you can put in your comments and make sure that you put in your name and email as well. Uh, in case you've missed this recording or you want to go back and view it all over again, you can please follow the, uh, our website or the Facebook and as well as the YouTube channel. Yeah, I'd like to hand over to Dr. Eddie, who will introduce our speaker. Thank you, Dr. Anu. Then uh, let us uh, invite our first speaker, Dr. Uh, Dr. Irabadi Ilava Jadi Srinivasan. Sorry, Dr. Jadi. Dr. Jadi is the staff uh, anesthesiologist at the Hospital of Force Children in Toronto. He's also a assistant professor in the University of Toronto in Canada. Dr. Jedi will talk about the regional anesthesia in neonates. Dr. Jedi, the floor, the screen is yours. Hello, greetings from Canada and circuits to all our colleagues in Asia who are joining this webinar. First, I would like to thank ASBA, Dr. Anu and Dr. Teddy for the kind invitation. In the next 20 minutes, I'll review the current state of regional anesthesia in neonates and some of the emerging concepts and new techniques. These are my objectives. At the end of this talk, the listeners will be able to analyze the risks and benefits of regional anesthesia in neonates, apply at least three carefully considered regional techniques they can use in their own practice. We'll be able to develop a system to integrate regional anesthesia as a standard through a partnership with surgeons, nurses, and neonatologists. Let's consider this newborn, a three kilo 60 old term male child. He's posted for a left-sided congenital diaphragmatic hernia repair using a sub left subcostal incision and, and closure of the defect. His ventilation and cardiac status are stable and it's ready for extubation, but he needs his surgery first. The NICU team has read in their journal about post-op regional anesthesia as a means for reducing opioids in the post-op period for some of these kids. And they were very keen for you to offer one. I want you to think about the options. Let's talk about our first objective, the risk and benefits of regional anesthesia. But before that, why do we need to treat pain? Before 1980s, the assumption uh, was neonates, especially preterm babies, did not feel any pain. We now know that even as a 16 week old fetus has enough neuronal network to response to painful stimuli. In the 80s, pain was poorly treated. We gave vapor and muscle relaxants. This all changed when the Anand and colleagues showed that 
preterm neonates undergoing PDA ligations um, who did not receive any opioids had significantly higher hormonal stress response compared to neonates who did receive opioid. This started our understanding of the importance of pain management and led to our current prevalent use of opioids to manage surgical pain in neonates. What happens when you don't treat pain well? Besides the above stress response, numerous studies have shown that are harmful effects when neonates have repeated and prolonged pain exposure. These include altered pain processing, cognitive and behavioral changes, and poor executive functioning. Even MRI changes have been identified in such infants. We are better now. We have excellent opioid-based pain management options after major surgeries. But opioids have serious side effects. We know that neonates and infants in the NICU setting who receive opioids have long duration of mechanical ventilation, they have feeding delays, and they also may exhibit long-term effects, including impact brain growth, poor social skills, and short-term memory deficits. However, when people looked closely at these data, they also found that there may be a dose-dependent effect on this. That is, that low-dose opioid regimen show no worsening in long-term developmental outcomes or neuroimaging, suggesting that the low levels are likely to be safe. Just ponder this statement. So it gives us a little window where if we can decrease the opioid using regional techniques, we can avoid some of the negative effects. That brings to, uh, to the next point. We all, have, we all have read about the controversial association between anesthetic exposure and neurodevelopment outcomes. This continues to be discussed and debated. And there is a possibility that this neurotoxicity could be dose and duration related. And this is the current thought that if we can use a regional anesthetic to decrease the amount of anesthetic intraoperatively and decrease the opioid postoperatively, hopefully we can mitigate some of these effects. Next, how strong is the evidence for regional anesthesia in neonates? What is efficacy? In neonates who had epidural for TEF repair, they spent less number of days on the ventilator. Also, neonates who had epidural for major abdominal surgery has had less stress response compared to infants who got mo just morphine. And babies who did not get any pain relief or EMLA, uh, with, uh, EMLA or penile block for circumcision, they showed exaggerated pain response to later, to later vaccination. So we know that it is the regional, well-conducted regional is very effective, but is it safe? If you look at the safety data generated from large prospective studies and audits, we clearly know that the use of regional, pediatric regional techniques, even in neonates, is safe. Yes, they have higher, com neonates have higher complication compared to infants and bigger children, but the majority of the complications are minor, and the serious ones could be avoided by following safe practices, including a carefully conducted block placement, sticking to the recommended dose guidelines and monitoring standards. But before we embark on the specific techniques, the basic difference in units should be appreciated. In units and young infants, the conus medullaris ends at approximately L3 level. Let me pick up the, here. Um, so the conus medullaris ends at L3 level. Um, so if you're doing a lumbar puncture, you should, be, you should be placing the needle between L4 and L5 or L5 and S1. Okay. And similarly, the thecal space you can see ends at S3 level. So if you are accessing the caudal block using a needle technique, you make sure that you don't thread the needle too long because you can accidentally cause a dural puncture. Similarly, um, other changes, they include the CS of volume and production is larger in units. And that's the reason why the spinal doesn't last long. And also you may need to give a more milligram per kilo basis for the local anesthetic. The nerves are thinner and less myelinated, so less concentration, such as 0.125, is as effective as 0.25 to produce a sensory block. Similarly, the pharmacological differences need to be appreciated. There is less binding protein, and the immature enzyme system means 
there's going to be a higher plasma concentration for the same dose per kilogram, which means there is going to be a higher toxicity. And, and in fact, a neonates runs a higher risk of cardiotoxicity. And so you have to decrease the bolus and infusion dose in neonates. That brings us to the, uh, our second objective. What are the regional techniques we can offer to the neonates? When we look at this neonates presenting with surgery and the incision dermatomes to be blocked, um, very often it is in the thoracic region. So almost all blockade of the thoracic nerves are required from T4 to T12 and after L1. So what are the most effective regional techniques to block T4 to L1 levels? Knowing we need to block these nerves, uh, the effective blocks we can do, in my view, are these four main blocks that shown to be very efficacious. One is spinal anesthetic, second, the caudal block, and third is a thoracic epidural. However, likely, we will, as we will discuss further, um, a cardly placed thoracic epidural, and finally, paravertebral block. Um, I've not listed the facial plane block as their effectiveness is very limited by the volume required in these small children. Infant spinal has been around for a long time. Spinal can be safely performed in neonates and is particularly useful when you want to avoid airway instrumentation and the surgery is short. My personal experience is with children in bronchopulmonary dysplasia and subglottic stenosis undergoing um, hernia repair. There is extensive list of surgeries such as PDA ligation, pyloromyotomies, colostomies, where, it has been, where spinal has been done uh, when combined with the caudal to prolong the block. In the interest of time, I will not go through the procedural detail. Um, with the spinal anesthetic, the main limitation is the duration, which, uh, as, as we mentioned, we can be extended by threading a caudal catheter after the spinal anesthetic. And as we stated before, this familiarity with the neuroaxial anatomy is important as the conus lies close to L3, and hence L4, 5, and S1 space should be chosen. I want to add three things about the neonatal spinal. Um, I'm not going to go into the, again, the technical details, uh, but if in, in the management of the case, if the baby is fussy and you have tried the solution and if it fails, you need to consider adding sedation. I wouldn't consider adding sedation as a failure of the block. In one study, especially in a center where they perform this block often, they noted that at least 24% that is one in four babies needed sedation in even very in a very experienced centers. Babies can be fussy for various reasons. Okay. Second, high spinal can lead to bradycardia and apnea, and we if we have to be prepared to control the airway if required. And third, even though there is no wake up time after spinal, however, monitor the babies for at least 12 hours apnea free if they are premature. This is just to show images of a proper way to place a cautery pad and never to have the baby head down as we risk the rostral spread of the local anesthetic. Especially, don't, um, don't lift the baby up to place the cautery pad. The second block I want to mention is the cautery block. This is the most commonly employed regional technique in children and is equally um, feasible in neonates. It's safe, simple, effective. Very often we combine it with general anesthetic. You can do it with any, for any intraumbilical surgeries. The common ones we often do are colostomies, hernias, perineal surgery, and even in uh, some of these preterm babies who need a lower extremity pick line. It is a very effective technique uh, if we don't want to um, give any anesthetic. Uh, of course, we can extend the coverage for upper abdominal surgeries, um, and you need a higher volume, but however, this also means that you need to think about the toxic dose of the BPOCaine, you would need to consider diluting the solution to increase the volume. In the interest of time, I will omit the technical details. Uh, they are no different than infant caudal anesthetic. WFSA has a good resource online uh, of the technical details of the block. Our practice is used to use an IV catheter technique we use a 24 gauge in small neonates and a 22 gauge in full term 
and infants. And remember the dura is so close to the S3 level, it's only half to one centimeter within the top end of the hiatus. So you need to be careful when you're using a your needle technique, you don't advance it too far. You can risk causing a dural puncture. Um, this image also we shown a, a Crawford needle. And this is a 20 gauge Crawford needle um, specifically designed for caudal placement. We tend to use it for infant caudal block not for um, neonatal cord. Here are some of the clips of a neonatal cord performed by one of our uh, fellows, Dr. Melody, um, a competent fellow from Singapore. We use that opportunity also to confirm the block placement and spread using ultrasound. So the first image you will see uh, Melody placing a I'll repeat that. Um, you can see her threading the coral uh, catheter in place. The second one, she's going to aspirate, inject, aspirate. and make sure. Um, and just look at the ECG to make sure that there are no ECG changes. And finally, we use that. As I said, we use the opportunity to look at the spread. You can see the candle coming. And then uh, you can see the distension of, of the epidural space, and that is the CSF. Um, so and you can see the distension on uh, about the dura. That's the dura, and this is the spinal cord. And if you move the probe higher, we can even track the local analgesic spread high up to the lumbar and thoracic segment using the ultrasound. Sorry, I'm just uh, trying to play this video. All right. Now, um, this is a paper from British Columbia Children's Hospital where they have successfully used a caudal anesthetic and IV sedation without instrumenting the airway for a laparoscopic hernia repair. They, in fact, published as a case series. I have pers no personal experience with this technique. Our practice is mostly to use a general anesthesia with endotracheal tube and single shot caudal for um, infant hernias, um, for laparoscopic in inguinal hernias. As I mentioned before, neonates undergoing major surgery receive a thoracic or abdominal incision and need a thoracic epidural. However, a direct thoracic epidural is risky and controversial. It's been debated multiple times by experts in this area. Um, a few people do, do thoracic epidural generally routinely. But why is thoracic epidural risky? Let's look at the ultrasound of the thoracic region of a neonate here. And let me pick up the laser pointer. We can appreciate the spinous process. That's the dura, that's the transverse process, and that's the spinal cord. You can straight away see two potential risks. One is that the dura, and when you measure it, the, the distance between the skin to the dura is 1.1 centimeter. And you can see, you can easily, if you're not careful, it can cause a, a dura puncture. And second, you can cause direct spinal cord injury. So as I said, a few pediatric anesthesiologists are brave and competent to place a direct thoracic epidural in this neonatal population. Instead, most will choose to thread a, a catheter through the caudal route or through the lumbar route to reach the thoracic level. How do we, how it is done, normally done? You measure from the puncture side to the level of the planned surgical incision, and then you're going to introduce the catheter gently. Um, you're going to use an 18 gauge cannula and you will access the hiatus as you would do for a single shot caudal and you will use a 21 gauge epidural catheter. 
We expect the cancer to go to the right measured spot. However, they may not listen to you and may, may end up exiting the foramen. Um, they can form a loop, they cannot. Uh, all possible things can happen. So when blindly placed to catheters, as, as, they may not, as I said, they may not end up where you want to in, for them to sit. If we consider putting an epidural, we have to make an effort to ensure that it's in the right location. Uh, so here it's the case we don't routinely uh, thread blindly. We use one of the modalities to confirm the tip placement. We either use an ultrasound um, and use a stylated catheter, but which can be seen through the ultrasound. Um, or sometimes we use a fluoro and use a radio pack catheter. Um, but the more common one way we can confirm the placement is, is to do an epidogram yeah, and fluoroscopy. And we use 0.5 ml of Omnipic, 180 milligram per ml concentration. Um, this X-ray shows a catheter uh, that the intended target is a green box, and it is you can see the catheter is coiled um, in the in the lumbar region. And another image of a epidogram um, in the name that was scheduled for a side procedure. The first picture is what the intended target is, that um, marker. And this was the images are from one of my colleagues. Um, as I said, the plan was to insert the caudal catheter and thread it to T8 as shown in the first image. The second image is shown, the, the catheter threaded easily to around 11 centimeters or so. And then when they did the epidogram, as you can see, uh, you can see the catheter, but sort of a, the dye is sort of a pulled in the sacral region. That's the sacrum. I'm sorry, that's not, may not be very obvious. That's actually the sacrum. And these are the onset of the lumbar vertebrae going higher. Um, it probably escaped through the foramen um, uh, and the dye is just pulled around and sacrum. And the, when the, they managed to reinsert the catheter, you can now, and they did the repeat the epidogram. You can see that the cats are there and the spread of the dye in their intended target. One of the rare but serious complications in the original original block is overdose of local anesthetic. The, so you have to you have to decrease the bolus dose, you have to decrease the infusion dose. And do not exceed 0.2 milligram per kilo per hour. And reconsider after 48 hours if you're still running the epidural and to think about the risk and benefits. Chlorprocaine is less toxic in units and has been often um, um, used in, in this population. But however, here in Canada, we don't have access to it. When you look at the complication related to uh, neonatal epidural cancer in units, the risk and benefits of any treatment modality should be considered before applying to any patient. In this study, they looked at the neonatal epidural cancer as part of the PRAN network uh, database. The neuraxial cancer techniques appear to be safe in units. That's a good thing. But people were using about the recommended dose of local anesthetics. Uh, so the author was suggesting that a strong need for quality assurance to ensure that people stick to the dose guidelines. I want to quickly mention about the paravertebral block. It is an intermediate skill block. The risk in this block includes puncturing the, the pleura or accidentally getting into the epidural space. Okay. If you have access to a good ultrasound machine, the great sonar anatomy presented by the neonates because of the delayed ossification can make this block a lot, safe, lot more safer. And you can appreciate the main landmarks in this picture, the transverse process, the pleura, the spinous process. And if you, and this is the rib, and if you angle the probe, and you will see the faint line of the costal transverse ligament that runs from the, sorry, let me put the laser pointer and point it again. Um, this is a spinous process, that's a transverse process, that's the pleura. Again, that's the pleura, and that's the rib, the transverse process here. And uh, if you angle the probe, you will see the faint line of the costal transverse ligament running just in anterior to the, to the transverse process onto the, onto the pleura. So you need to lose the sight of the transverse process to get to the inter rib space and move the probe medially to get to see the costal transverse ligament.
just to show you a video of um, a paravertebral block. The needle is inserted lateral to medial and a pop is felt when it punctures the internal intercostal membrane or the costal transfer ligament. And if you, when you inject, the local energy called the expand the space and cause the displacement. We are looking for the displacement of the pleura. Be careful that you don't direct the needle any further the tip of the needle because the tip of the needle will be just behind the uh, TP and uh, don't and you will not be able to see the tip very well if even if you are in the right place. So you just need to get to the costal transverse ligament and once you feel the pop you inject and look for the pleural drop. I'll just play that again and you will be able to appreciate the drop of the pleura once the local anesthetic is injected. Now, um, external oblique inter, uh, intercostal fascial plane block, it's a relatively new regional technique. It's been used for a variety of upper abdominal surgeries. It's been used in adults, and there are a few case reports in, in, in neonates as well. It involves placing the local anesthetic below the external oblique fascia. Let me pick the laser pointer. Um, that's the rib, that's the external oblique. Essentially, the probe is placed in the in the paramedian fashion, in the midclavicular line, on the fifth and sixth rib spaces, and you can see the rib that's the external oblique. Um, the idea is to get the needle in plane below the external oblique fascia onto the rib as a stopgap, and you want to inject below the fascia and see the spread of the local anesthetic on in this particular plane. It appears to be an easy block to learn and apply, and cancer can be play, um, placed, and it avoids getting close to the surgical field, and in fact, you can place um, pre-incision. Here's a reference to the technique. The authors used a hourly programmed intermittent boluses of chloroprocaine. The cancers stayed for nearly five days, and that particular neonate received only three doses of morphine in that five-day period. And the author's um, opinion is that this could be a good alternative regional anesthetic technique when epidural analgesia is contraindicated. And finally, coming to our third uh, objective, making regional anesthetic part of the standard of care. This is a very telling publication on how to set up such a program. The authors in this study wanted to improve their regional technique in their NIC population by 80%. They, uh, the, at the end of the study period, they not only achieved that, but also they showed a reduction in the opioid requirements, reduction in the need for duration of mechanical ventilation. Uh, they developed a process map, the comprehensive education, communication, they involved the regional block team, the pain nurses, the surgeons, um, the anesthesiologist, and they in fact added 30 minutes to the to the booking time so that it's not coming off because placement of the blocks takes time and it's not so that the time does not coming off the surgical operating time. The, sur the surgeons were happy and they had a great success. The out of the 30 of the 34 infants um, they did during the study period, the total opioid exposure dropped. As you can see um, here, you can see the drop from uh, 5 to 1.1 milligram in the intervention group. And they also uh, noticed that the average time to extubation dropped from 40 hours in the baseline period to 19.9 hours. And after intervention, in fact, two, two thirds of their patients, or uh, sorry, 70% um, of their patients were extubated in the operating room as compared to 10.5 in the baseline period. So this shows that a multidisciplinary collaboration helps to convert the use of regional anesthetic uh, from an optional to a new standard of care. So coming back to our case, um, we presented in the beginning of this, uh, this talk, the new bond with this congenital diaphragmatic hernia. The options include IV opioid infusion, 
that would be a very reasonable if there is a plan for prolonged ventilation if the closure is very tight um, but the often chosen one could be um, the cardly threaded epidural that would be my choice if everything is stable and we are looking at not more than 24 hours of ventilation afterwards this could be a very very good option direct thoracic epidural as i said it's controversial uh, very few anesthesiologists practice it still um, Paravertebral catheter is an option, um, so is the newly uh, identified external oblique catheter, but the information on this is, is still evolving. So in summary, we discussed the risk and benefits of regional anesthetic. We talked about the different options um, on selective patient population. And also we talked about a multidisciplinary engagement that helped to make a region as a standard of care. So in conclusion, I'll leave you with these two statements. There is a possibility that any anesthetic related neurotoxicity could be dose related. There is some evidence to show that neurodevelopment outcomes are affected by higher level of opioid in using neonates and adding regional anesthetic um, whenever possible safely will potentially decrease this uh, morbidity and there I'll stop I look forward to the panel discussion to explore some of the challenging areas and uh, thank you for listening Dr. Srinivasan thank you so much for your uh, extremely informative and um, exhaustive talk that was great um, I think we'll move on to the poll question uh, and I, it's probably a little tough for the audience. Maybe a little tough for the audience by asking them a question at the end of the your talk. But this is just to keep our objectives in view so that we know that this webinar is helpful. So we have a 3.5 kg neonate and who undergoes laparotomy for mid-gut volvulus. And uh, we are we, using fluoroscopic guidance. We have planned an epidural catheter at the end of surgery to aid pain management. We have extubated the child. So what is the recommended dose for maximum infusion rate for this child? Uh, you can start your uh, time starts now. You are given 30 seconds to answer this question. Meanwhile, Dr. JD, I think after listening to your uh, I mean your uh, presentation, I'm sure our listeners will probably answer when they have questions about regional anesthesia from the surgeons or the parents. As thank you so much. Okay. Uh, so we do have our, uh, the results are out. Uh, Dr. Jay, uh, could you please uh, take over and uh, disclose what is the answer and your views on that as well? Uh, thanks, Anu. I uh, hope uh, you can hear me, Anu. Yes, yes, Dr. Jay, we can hear you. Okay, sure. Uh, well, we, we talked about the dose even in one of the slides about the BPUK getting accumulated, especially after infusion in neonates because of their low, um, both uh, from the point of uh, having low protein binding as well as the metabolism, the liver enzymes are not um, adequately formed at that stage. So in, in, in children's, we stick somewhere between 0.1 to 0.3 milligram per kilo per hour. 0.5 milligram per kilo per hour. However, in neonatal population, especially less than six months of age, we should not exceed more than 0.2 at the max 0.25 milligram per kilo per hour. Um, and especially if you're using bupivacaine, you stick to 48 hours interval and if don't exceed that. And beyond 48 hours, you need to uh, look at the risk and benefits very, very closely. If you still need to continue that infusion catheter through the epidural. Uh, if you're using ropivacaine, you can go up to like 72 hours. It's been shown that ropivacaine is slightly, uh, can be run longer period. Again, close monitoring uh, and looking at risk balance. So the appropriate answer would be choice B for this question. Thank you, Dr. Jerry. I think, yeah, we, are, we were there more. At least 50% of the audience has got it at 0.1. And 37% have got it at 0.25 mg per kg. That's great. Yeah, it's true. Uh, I mean, if you, are, if you are on the safer side of 0.1, it's very good. Thank you, Dr. Jerry. Uh, so going on to the next uh, uh, talk on pharmacological management of neonatal pain, we have with us Dr. Narsimha Rao, who is a neonatal consultant at UK. 
and uh, he's joining us from Liverpool to guide us through various aspects of pharmacological approaches to neonatal pain management. Um, just to with Dr. Uh, about uh, Dr. Rao, I, I just wanted to commend him on the various philanthropic activities that he's been doing uh, for the state of Karnataka that I'm in, I live in. He's associated with the Hemophilia Society and the Liverpool Hemophilia Society and the Karnataka Hemophilia Society. They have been bestowed the best winning award every quarter. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Rao, and we are honored to have you here. The screen is yours. Hello, everyone. My name is Dr. Narsim Rao. I'm one of the neonatal consultants at University Hospitals of North Midlands. I'm also the training program director for the School of Pediatrics in the region of uh, West Midlands in UK. Today, I'm here to talk about pharmacological management of neonatal pain. So thank you very much, ASPA, for giving me this opportunity today to talk about this very important um, and relevant topic for all of us. Um, let's, let's go through uh, a slight introduction to the neonatal pain management. Uh, what's the importance of it, where are the sources of the pain, what's the impact on the developing brain and various assessment tools that's available right now. Uh, we also will touch upon the pharmacological approaches uh, to the pain management uh, based on uh, uh, evidence and the current recommendations uh, and we'll follow a coordinated approach into pain management. <clears throat> so the research has shown that preterm infants from as early as 24 weeks gestation have got the ability to appreciate and respond to pain uh, in a variable degree, but they still can appreciate pain and hence uh, the pain should be considered uh, in, in infants as premature as 24 weeks. And how do we know that? They do have some um, um, ways of assessing them. We're looking at physiological uh, parameters, the changes within their vital signs. Uh, the behavioral patterns and the metabolic um, markers as well as hormonal indicators of pain why do we manage pain it's it's purely it's an ethical it's not a, it's not an ethical consideration but it's also the fact that we just have to address pain because they can appreciate it and it's immoral in the first place to be uh, inflicting pain uh, in guiding by the ethical principles of our uh, practice as medical professionals and second thing is the the short and long term adverse sequelae of pain, which we might need to be mindful about. Which, um, I'll, I'll go through in my subsequent slides. <clears throat> there are three different sources of pain just to categorize them. One is an acute uh, type of pain, an established pain and a prolonged pain. So the acute pain is inflicted when we carry about procedures and interventions, including diagnostic and therapeutic ones on the neonatal intensive care or uh, pediatric intensive care or beyond. The second form is an established pain uh, inflicted during post-surgical management or during the birth trauma, etc. The third type is the one inflicted upon by the medical conditions and illnesses such as uh, NEC and meningitis, which lead to a prolonged pain. The, the study done in, uh, uh, in 2003, published in 2003, described that th there were about roughly 14 episodes of procedural interventions on the infant on the newborn infant especially uh, on the day of admission or the day of birth um, <clears throat> where it might have contributed to the pain in an infant in a preterm infant or a newborn infant uh, almost about 40 percent of them uh, in this prospective uh, analysis found that there was no consideration for uh, pain relief so the next is the impact of the pain as i said earlier it has got short and long-term outcomes there are neurobehavioral and developmental outcomes that have been studied which have been adversely affected by their experience of pain during the uh, uh, neonatal admission. Uh, there's also uh, some somatic signs such as decreased weight gain and lower intellectual quotient in these infants uh, who have experienced uh, pain. Uh, and this is, this is what uh, research has shown us, but assessing the pain, uh, which we consider as the fifth vital sign, is complex it's not easy in infants because one they're unable to report pain unlike in adults uh, second there is a, a multitude of validated scores that are available which makes it trickier because there's plenty to choose from uh, and some of them variably guided by the evidence base and the third is uh, the, the, these 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 all these things the common ground is the fact that they rely on 
few common denominators being the grimace crying or the general demeanor of um, their response to pain. Accordingly, uh, the, the, as I said, uh, this is a summary of all the pain scales that have sourced from the article referenced below. You know, th th there's a multitude amount of uh, uh, you know, scales, but we do use the one in the middle, which is called as the NPA scale currently on a unit and probably the most widely used across uh, UK neonatal units. The, hence, as I said earlier, I will leave this slide uh, for viewing later on, and this is included in the set of resources that I've collected to be shared with you on the deck. Okay. Now, the approach to uh, analgesia, there's a structure and tiered approach starting from uh, baseline procedures up to the tier five. These are graded on an increasing severity of uh, pain that's uh, experienced by a neonate. Uh, and hence it starts from as simple as placing, uh, you know, uh, transcutaneous uh, markers or uh, monitoring equipment rising uh, rising all of all the way up to uh, deeper invasive uh, uh, procedures such as chest strain placement or wound treatment etc and hence according to this graded uh, uh, infliction inflicted pain uh, and stress response the pharmacological uh, and non pharmacological approaches have been uh, have been created according to this uh, tiered approach so the baseline and the tier 1 procedures are felt to be responsive to non-pharmacological means such as oral uh, glucose or uh, nutritive sucking or breast or bottle feeding, swaddling them and then followed by tier 2 procedures where it's felt that topical anesthetics should be able to counter the pain uh, management. Uh, the tier, procedure, tier 3 procedures are slightly more invasive um, such as when a puncture, arterial puncture circumcision where paracetamol might have a greater role in their uh, pain control followed by local anesthetics and deeper sedation and anesthetics for um, anesthesia for a higher um, degree of uh, pain inflicted. So we're, we're targeting at uh, the layer of tier two where uh, topical anesthetics might have a role. The baseline and tier one, which are countered by non-pharmacological means of analgesia are explained by our uh, co-speaker today. Now, amongst the topical analgesics, the most widely used and available is uh, the Emla cream, uh, which is probably the only studied uh, medication. Um, and that's been widely studied in, the, in, in circumcision when a puncture, lumbar puncture, um, and it's a topical application over the skin. The side effects are uh, commonly encountered skin irritation, whereas rarely if it enters the bloodstream might trigger methemoglobinemia in those who are uh, vulnerable. The paracetamol next on the layer and the tier three approach of uh, analgesia uh, has been proven to be clinically effective and relatively safe. It's available in a wide range of formulations such as oral, IV and rectal. It can, it can be used where procedures are considered to be mild to moderate in the, as I said, in the tier three of uh, approach, followed by uh, it's, it's a super additive effect when combined with morphine and hence it gives a better analgesic profile to be mindful about its uh, uh, potential hepatic and renal toxicity and hence monitoring the same whilst using uh, paracetamol, especially in the ones who are, have got a compromised liver or renal function. The local anesthetics are found to be uh, are less studied but have been found to be useful in certain instances such as line placement or circumcision. Uh, drugs such as lidocaine have been uh, trialed and used uh, to, be to bear in mind the risk of seizures, arrhythmias and uh, tissue necrosis, especially if used with epinephrine. <clears throat> tier 4 and 5 goes into uh, a more uh, severe pain um, and hence needs higher level of uh, pain and sedation um, uh, management. So in, in uh, the, the kind of drugs that we have been familiar with are uh, opiates such as morphine and fentanyl, ketamine and others such as metazolam and dexmedetomidin. Of, of these three groups, probably the most widely used are the opiates, such as morphine and fentanyl. Uh, its use has been described and in common practice been used in uh, babies who are mechanically ventilated uh, for as a pre-medication uh, cocktail, in chest strain insertion, incision and drainage or post-operative pain relief. Fentanyl is probably the more preferred agent between the two because of its uh, short-term rapid pain reduction side, uh, profile. It has got less hemodynamic side effects and GI dysmotility in retention in comparison to morphine. 
the side effects of course are uh, with the chest wall rigidity especially it's it, relate, it relates to the rate of administration uh, and those uh, dependent uh, side effect that being the uh, respiratory depression to also uh, practitioners will be fairly aware of it's being reversed with the use of naloxone uh, longer use uh, and prolonged use can lead to tolerance and dependence as we do encounter in other population we, we do see the same uh, same behavior pattern in uh, preterm infants as well now ketamine and others uh, as described above there's a very limited data to guide its use in routine practice although there have been sporadic instances where that have been used now we do know that these these are the agents and uh, there are barrier there are a tiered approach to the pain but there are barriers to the use of uh, why don't why is it not strongly considered as against in other populations and other areas of medicine one it's not a matter of it's not to be blamed but there is a lack of consideration towards pain or lack of uh, holistic view towards pain in especially when it's newborn uh, and hence i started off my slide by saying that they can appreciate pain and it must be considered teamwork especially between uh, when it involves multitude of professionals uh, intensivists uh, anesthetic surgeons uh, and uh, medical and nursing teams etc uh, need to have a coordinated and structured approach an, an organized team working often leads to uh, is, is, is considered to be a barrier in its ongoing uh, continued assessment and management of pain there is insufficient expertise in using pain management uh, pain assessment tools uh, and that's because there's there's a multitude of uh, tools available and there's lack of familiarity with the with the tools there's lack of familiarity with the pain management medication and hence these these all and summatively add to the gaps in uh, the, the knowledge that are currently existing which are genuine gaps because of lack of research and lack of availability of evidence as well as when it translates into practice uh, in regards to management and assessment of pain which is what leads to uh, not routine use of uh, pain and analgesia uh, analgesic consideration in newborns since since 2006 there has been lots of uh, uh, awareness amongst uh, re researchers and clinicians to uh, come up with a strategy to counter neonatal pain and to create an awareness of it. National organizations such as American Academy of Pediatrics and Canadian Pediatric Society accordingly in 2016 and 17 published their policy statements to guide guidelines uh, to form uh, address this uh, important topic of neonatal pain. Uh, there are some well-sourced guidelines from uh, SickKids Toronto as well as West of Scotland in UK uh, to inform us on the practice. Uh, a recent uh, scientific review also has got a good summary of all the practices. I will be sharing this in the form of a QR code, a list of resources for you to uh, read later. In summary, <clears throat> the pain management needs a coordinated approach. Uh, first of all, we can start off by, uh, I mean, none of these is a, uh, you know, a barrier between uh, established uh, uh, countries with established practices, whereas uh, countries uh, or centers where practices are uh, yet to be defined. What it requires is uh, a starting point is to sit down multidisciplinary team to create a policy uh, which addresses at prevention, at assessment and management of pain. And the, the core goal or the aim should be to prevent uh, uh, as much as pain possible or uh, prevent the procedures that lead to pain and to recognize the pain as well as to address the pain minimize the pain to be as much uh, as 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 optimal as uh, possible to have a regular and structured uniform assessment for pain management amongst all the multidisciplinary team involved in care of a newborn and to anticipate and follow a tiered approach as i described earlier to you know, based on the procedure to be undertaken and to address the pain accordingly the implementation of course will require multidisciplinary approach it requires a buy-in from all the stakeholders as well as regular and ongoing teaching and training uh, and a strong robust clinical governance uh, structure to ensure that the practices are followed uh, and uh, the, the, the the practices are audited um, and uh, incidents are reported so this this is a summary of all my uh, uh, the pharmacological approaches i will be sharing a slide on uh, accessing the resources that i've shared in my uh, talk today thank you very much Thank you very much, Dr. Rao, for a very interesting talk. Now we will have another poll questions from Dr. Rao.
uh, which of the following statement is true regarding the pharmacological management of neonatal pain? The opioid are the A's. The opioid are contraindicated in units due to their respiratory depressant effects. Paracetamol is the first line analgesic for mild to moderate pain in neonates, and non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs are preferred over paracetamol for post operative pain in neonates. And the last, ketamine is an effective and safe sedative and analgesic for neonates undergoing pain procedures. You have 30 seconds to answer the questions. And we will invite Dr. Rao. Okay, Dr. Rao, uh, we have here. Perfect, I think that uh, most of them have got the answer right today. Um, <clears throat> Indeed, uh, paracetamol is the first line for mild to moderate pain, as I just explained in my mm -hmm. tiered approach. Uh, hence, uh, it would be considered as uh, uh, the, uh, the right answer in this situation. Uh, the few other, mm -hmm. I mean, my reasons for others not being the right answer. Uh, <clears throat> opioids are not contraindicated. Opioids, in fact, are, um, and they are uh, used, but with, used with caution and uh, with close monitoring. Uh, as they can, and as we know, the side effects of opioid, including like uh, respiration, constipation, and all. I was just monitoring the Q and A. One of them has asked, uh, "What are the side effects of opioids?" Uh, so we, we ought to be careful with the use of uh, opioids and use it where sparingly, where absolutely indicated. Second, uh, the question relates to NSAIDs. NSAIDs are not preferred over paracetamol, unlike uh, what we have, uh, the option says. Mm -hmm. And that's that's because there's a high risk of adverse effects with NSAIDs, like as we know, renal impairment, spontaneous gastrointestinal perforation, um, etc. <clears throat> next, uh, okay. we, uh, the next option is the ketamine. Uh, ketamine, ketamine is yes. it's it's not very often used. It's not uh, as effective and safe sedative analgesic for neonates, especially for those undergoing painful procedures. Uh, we, we do know about its uh, side effects and the, the same range. Neonates. So raised intracranial pressure, salivation, and et cetera. So yeah. uh, of, of these choices, uh, paracetamol is the first line analgesic. Okay. Then what we have here is the, uh, you can find in the QR code that uh, the resources for the pharmacological approach uh, to neonatal pain. It's additional uh, uh, literature for us to read. Uh, for the pharmacological approach to neonatal pain. Thank you very much, Dr. Rao. And we will continue for our third speaker. It will be Dr. Pratik Bandia. Dr. Pratik is, uh, Dr. Bandia is the Associate Professor of uh, Neonatology and Special Neonatal Care Unit Nodal Officers in Indira Gandhi Institute of Child in Bangalore. Dr. Uh, Bandia, the screen is yours. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm going to discuss about the non-pharmacological interventions in neonatal pain. At the outside, I'd like to thank the Asian Society of Pediatric uh, Anesthesiologists for giving me this opportunity to present on this topic. The overview of my presentation includes uh, importance of pain management in units, <clears throat> common procedures in the NICU requiring pain management, common pharmacological measures, and what is the current evidence. Coming to introduction, the pain perception starts uh, as early as uh, second trimester in the neonate. Approximately 70% of the procedures in the NICU are painful and sick neonates experience dozens of procedures per week and you know over hundreds of pricks over the entire duration of hospitalization. And most of the pain in the neonates is usually undertreated, especially in developing countries where many of the painful procedures are not treated properly. So why do we need to treat pain in neonates? We need to train, uh, treat pain because the newborn's threshold for the pain is likely lower compared to the older children and adults. It's again to reduce the distress and suffering because of the pain. If the pain is not treated, it results in altered processing at the spinal and supraspinal level and it has an implications on the long-term neurodevelopment, especially with respect to the learning and social adaptation. So coming to the non-pharmacological methods, non-pharmacological methods are nothing but the pain elevating or diverting methods uh, without the use of medications. They are useful in uh, mild to moderate pain. They are commonly used as initial measure as compared to the pharmacological measures. 
in this slide comparing the non pharmacological measures with uh, pharmacological measures we can see it is the non pharmacological measure which is most commonly employed method for uh, treatment of the neonatal pain these are the common uh, needle puncture procedures uh, in the nicu which require analgesia among all these procedures the first five procedures that is intramuscular injection circuit injection use of heel lance veni puncture or venous cannulation these are the uh, very commonly performed procedures in the NICU which require pain. In this slide, we can see here the newborns experience somewhere between uh, 5 to 15 on an average of 5 to 15 procedures, uh, painful procedures per day in the first two weeks of life. And most of them are needle puncture procedures. Uh, coming to the tired approach, so since the pain in the neonates varies, the intensity of the painful procedures in the NICU varies. Uh, we have what is called as tired approach to analgesia and neonate. Uh, first, the first step is always to avoid the pain in the newborn by uh, using of non-invasive methods. If still it is not possible, then the next step is to uh, adapt non-pharmacological measures. Non-pharmacological measures are used, used mainly for the mild to moderate pain. So that comes under tire 1 of the pain management. So subsequent tire one, tire two, tire three, and tire four includes use of topical anesthetics, NSAIDs, local anesthetics, and finally IV uh, anesthetic medications, IV uh, pain, IV medications to relieve the pain, and also uh, anesthetics. The common non-pharmacological methods which are used to relieve pain are swaddling, containment, and facilitated tucking, non-nutritive sucking, skin-to-skin -skin care, use of sucrose and dextrose, that is the oral sweetening agents and music therapy and multisensory stimulation. Coming to swaddling, uh, containment and facilitating tucking. Swaddling is nothing but wrapping the baby uh, in a cloth or in a blanket with the uh, limbs flexed and uh, head in the neutral position. And facilitated tucking is nothing but holding the baby in the left lateral position with the uh, head and uh, the pelvis supported with slightly flexed portion. So both of these methods have been shown to decrease the biobehavioral response to the pain when compared to no treatment, but they're not much effective. They're less effective compared to the other known non-pharmacological measures. And these uh, methods such as swaddling, facilitated tucking and containment, they should be used only as an adjuvant treatment, not as a primary therapy. So coming to the evidence with respect to swaddling, swaddling has been shown to reduce the pain reactivity in number of studies and also the pain regulation. This is the evidence from the latest Cochrane review and uh, same same thing applies with respect to facilitated tucking it has been shown to reduce the pain reactivity in number of studies the overall effect size is favoring the tucking and also the immediate pain regulation it decreases the immediate pain regulation by almost uh, uh, 40 percent so in summary swaddling and facilitated tucking is a simple intervention in pain management it keeps the neonates in flexed position and restrains the infant limbs and decreases the motor disorganization uh, this is not to be used in a extremely preterm babies who have a fragile skin and also in the skin conditions in units a rare skin conditions such as epidermolysis bullosa. Coming to rocking and holding, this is one of the common procedures uh, which is uh, actually performed by the nurses when the baby is agitated or crying. A gentle rocking of the baby that is moving the baby back and forth and this has been shown to stimulate the vestibular nucleus but the exact mechanism in the pain relief is not known. It is also used as compared to swaddling, it is the rocking and holding movement is also used as adjuvant uh, with the more effective therapy. There are very less studies uh, with respect to rocking and holding, but whatever available studies are there, they have been shown to reduce the immediate pain regulation uh, with respect to rocking. Coming to the other commonly used uh, intervention for neonatal pain is non-nutritive sucking. Non-nutritive sucking means the placing a pacifier or a non-lactating nipple in the neonate's mouth to stimulate the sucking behavior. The action on the pain is immediate. One can off also offer an empty uh, breast. I mean, after the milk is expressed, the newborn can be you know, put on the breast to uh, stimulate the sucking. So this is called as non-nutritive sucking, where nutrition is not going into the baby's uh, body. So coming to the mechanism, uh, this pain relief is not related to the opioid release. It is mainly because of uh, sensory stimulation from the sucking which blocks the pain uh, or it may also provide distraction and newborns will be able to self-regulate their behavioral response better when they are uh, in the non nutritive sucking state. So there is also one hypothesis that it releases the serotonin release in the brain uh, but still not proven. 
Coming to the evidence with respect to non nutritive sucking, it has been shown to reduce the pain reactivity in numerous studies. It has also been shown to reduce the immediate pain re uh, regulation by almost 40%. So this is the again the evidence from the recent uh, Cochrane review on non-pharmacological interventions. So non-nutritive sucking is very easy and feasible. It can be used as an adjoint therapy, but one uh, disadvantage of uh, just using non-nutritive sucking as a non-pharmacological measure is that the newborns may anticipate the painful procedure every time an NNS is given. Means if it's if it's used as only the sole method, then every time a pacifier is placed in the baby's mouth, the newborn may think that the next the painful procedure is about to going to happen. So the anticipation of the pain when the pacifier is placed placed is one of the disadvantage of using this as an alone this as a sole therapy for pain relief. Coming to the breastfeeding and breast milk, we know the breastfeeding is the best. There are numerous benefits of breastfeeding and. Uh, here we are discussing about the pain. So the mechanisms of breastfeeding with pain relief is mainly because of release of endorphins and the oxytocin release, which has a pain reducing activity. And also there are some chemicals in the breast milk which help in reduction of the pain. A breastfeeding baby's attention is diverted and also the sucking behavior during breastfeeding also helps in redu reduction of the pain. So these are the multiple mechanisms through which breastfeeding helps in reduction of the pain. This is the latest Cochrane review on uh, uh, breast on the effect of breastfeeding in the procedural pain in the neonate. The common procedures which were uh, uh, evaluated were heel lands, venipuncture, intramuscular injection and also the ROP screening. The breastfeeding babies uh, had very less tachycardia. The duration of crying was also decreased in the babies who were breastfed during these painful procedures and also the pain scores such as uh, neonatal infant pain scale and neonatal facial coding, uh, coding system scores uh, were less in the babies who are breastfed. So breastfeeding is one of the ideal intervention and it, ha it has to be practiced. Uh, I mean, in the new newborn uh, who is undergoing a painful procedure and if it's feasible, it has to be uh, employed. If the newborn is an extreme preterm or a very uh, preterm baby who can't breastfeed in such babies, breast milk can be used. Coming to skin, still skin to skin care, also called as kangaroo mother care. We know the numerous benefits of KMC, like reduction in infant, infant mortality, reduction in hypothermia, and also reduction in inf severe infections. But with respect to pain, in uh, numerous studies, it has been shown that the kangaroo mother care or the skin to skin care, uh, the babies who are undergoing painful procedure during this uh, uh, skin to skin care, there is less tachycardia, there is reduction in the composite pain scores. And also the overall crying time is reduced in the babies who are undergoing this painful uh, procedure during the skin to skin care. So again, skin to skin care, it should be used as a non pharmacological pain method for common needle procedures in the preterm infants, especially useful in heel, heel prick. The barriers to implementation is mainly pragmatic in nature. That is whether uh, that is difficulty sometimes in taking the sample in the babies who are uh, undergoing KMC or sometimes uh, difficulty in uh, uh, non-availability of the mother or the caregiver during the uh, painful procedure. So these are mainly pragmatic in nature, but if, if at all, if there is an opportunity, uh, then the intervention should be clubbed during the time of KMC. Coming to oral sweetening agents, that is uh, the oral sucrose and dextrose. This oral sucrose is one of the most widely used non-pharmacological measures. Among the measures which I described till now, this is the most widely used. Among the sucrose and dextrose, sucrose is more commonly used than dextrose. The dose of sucrose ranges from 0.5 to 2 ml. The concentration which has been used across multiple studies ranges from 12 to 24 percent, but it is a 24 percent sucrose which is more commonly used. The onset of action is very quick. It acts within few seconds and the action peaks at two minutes and it will not last long. It has to be remembered that the oral sweetening agents is the short duration uh, pain elevating measure. It may last only up to 5 to 10 minutes. The calming effects may last st still longer compared to the analgesic effects. The mechanism of action by the sucrose and dextrose is mainly by the release of endogenous opioids which help in reducing the pain. And the calming and analgesic effects uh, through non-intuitive sucking also helps in reduction of the pain. Whenever sucrose is, or dextrose is offered into the baby's mouth, there will be some amount of sucking and the component of non-intuitive sucking also helps in reduction of the pain. So let us see what is the evidence. If you see the evidence, again, the recent uh, Cochrane review 
uh, from 2023, the overall effect size is actually favoring the sucrose. So sucrose has been shown to reduce the pain. In summary, the sucrose or glucose is well tolerated. Uh, with the current evidence, there is no much long-term side effects with the respect to use of sucrose. It has to be used uh, within one to two minutes before the painful procedure or just before the painful procedure. Every unit should have a unit specific protocol or guidelines for its use and also for the assessment of pain during the sucrose. It has to be used as a medication. One has to use it and track it as a medication and never use sucrose or dextrose just to soothe the baby whenever the baby is crying for a feed or anything. It should not be used or not should be, it should not be misused. It should be used as a medication and it should be tracked in the nurse's chart. Coming to music therapy, uh, only I'm going to briefly describe because there is another talk on this. Newborns exposed to music therapy have a greater physiological stability and uh, diminished pain response, uh, especially during the common pain, painful procedures. Coming to sensorial saturation, sensorial saturation is nothing but the multi-sensory stimulation uh, consisting of tactile, gustative, auditory and visual stimulus. Uh, this includes massaging the face, speaking to the baby uh, gently, which is, which is an auditory stimulation. Massaging the face is a gentle stimulation, is a tactile stimulation and instilling the sweet solution on infant tongue is a gustatory stimulation. And this multi-sensory stimulation has been uh, shown to reduce the pain scores in the common painful procedures such as heel lance, intramuscular injection or endotracheal suctioning. It mainly acts by preventing the travel of the painful stimulus when this uh, multisensory stimulation is given. So even the evidence uh, is in favoring of uh, multisensory stimulation. Again, from the recent Cochrane review, it has been shown that the babies undergoing painful procedures with multisensory stimulation have reduced pain reactivity. Well, so many interventions have been described till now, but which one to choose? We have described so many non-pharmacological measures. Which one to choose? This is the summary of the non-pharmacological measures which I described till now. Among them, the first three one, that is the use of oral sweetening solutions such as sucrose and dextrose, breastfeeding and skin to skin care. These three should be employed as a primary therapy for pain relief. Either of these three should be used as a primary non-pharmacological measures for pain relief and the rest of them that is use of uh, breast milk, swaddling, non to sucking, music therapy, sensorial stimulation, rocking and holding. All these measures can be used as an adjunct or adjuvant therapies. So whenever you, we are using a non-pharmacological me method, it is always better to use a primary therapy and then adjunct therapy. Primary therapy includes breastfeeding, skin to skin care and use of an oral sweetening solution, either of them. So in summary, uh, one has to provide effective pain management during the common needle procedures in the NICU, uh, improve the long-term neurological outcome in the new needs by minimizing the pain exposure during the key stage of development, always use primary therapies in combination with adjunct therapies. Thank you. Pratik, thank you so much for that extremely insightful talk. I generally believe that, you know, when you suggest now non-pharmacological techniques, people tend to scoff. And now all this information coming with Cochrane evidence, that is 2023, I, I sincerely hope the audience here takes all these uh, cues and go back and probably change their practice. That is the hope of this webinar. So coming back to the poll question. So regarding non-pharmacological techniques for pain management in children, which of the following should not be used as a primary therapy for pain relief? Uh, sweet tasting solutions like sucrose, breastfeeding, skin to skin care, or non nutritive something. The your time starts now. I feel very hopeful that all this information coming from a neonatologist will definitely make them think. Yeah, we should probably think non pharmacological techniques more use them more effectively. Okay. So we have our answers, which of the following should not be used. Most of them say about non-nutritive sucking. Uh, Prati, please uh, uh, this answer and share your opinion about it. Uh, yeah, as I mentioned in uh, uh, the presentation, uh, the non-nutritive sucking should not be used as a primary therapy for pain relief among the non-pharmacological measures. The first three, that is uh, either uh, oral sweetening agents such as sucrose or breastfeeding or a can be used. Uh -huh. 
but uh, breastfeeding uh, will be the first measure if at all if there is an opportunity if the mother is there that should be the ideal non pharmacological measure uh, for as a primary adjunct therapy for pain relief thank you dr pratik we definitely have a very attentive audience uh, so now let's welcome our next speaker ms kayla wong i believe her topic has generated quite some stir in most of us i mean i am looking forward to this extremely thought provoking and unusual idea about how music therapy can help neonates with pain uh, ms wong is a registered music therapist and uh, i just want to read her intro she has received her masters in music therapy from university of melbourne Uh, her clinical experiences are varied early intervention intensive care uh, neuro rehabilitation she has obtained an advanced training in neurological music therapy and is also a grandparent for rhythm breathing and lullaby uh, academy she is pursuing her phd in music therapy at temple university we are so honored to have you ms uh, kela here and i'm sure we have lots to learn from you the screen is all yours hello my name is kela wong and i'm a registered music therapist It is my pleasure to share with you about music therapy in the NICU. Today, I will be sharing specifically on how music therapists support premature infants and their families in pain. So, what is pain? The current definition by the International Association for the Study of Pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage this defines that there is a sense of physiological discomfort when experiencing pain premature babies have been reported to be hypersensitive to painful stimuli due to their immature nervous systems if their pain is not managed well during this time these babies are at risk of negative long-term consequences such as altered neurobehavioral development So, physiological pain in premature babies requires some extra attention. I would now like to turn our focus to psychological pain, also known as mental pain or emotional pain. It is the process of mental suffering that can be caused by losses, traumas, and unexpected negative situations. Parents of premature babies are confronted by an array of challenges. They are processing a sudden and early birth of their baby and face a demanding and stressful environment at the NICU. They are also very abruptly separated physically from their baby. All these factors put them in a position where they may experience feelings of depression, anxiety, and stress. Pain is ever present in the NICU. Babies have to endure a sudden transition of going from the safety and comfort of their mother's womb to a stressful environment with multiple alarm bells going off on the machines, constant chatter of stuff and visiting family members, and they often undergo multiple painful procedures. Parents may be feeling overwhelmed and uncertain of their baby's condition, and the mother is also healing from giving birth. Fathers are usually busy making sure both mother and baby are doing okay while making sure that things at home are running smoothly. These challenges can affect the quality of parent-infant interactions. The lack of contact between parents and infants can inhibit the bonding experience, which can further impact parents' confidence and ability to soothe and comfort their baby when they are in discomfort or pain. Music therapy is a profession that uses music as a non-pharmacological intervention to address these risks and pain points in the NICU. So, what is music therapy and how can it help this vulnerable population? The Association for Music Therapy Singapore defines music therapy as the scientific use of music interventions within a therapeutic relationship towards observable and measurable functional educational rehabilitative or well-being outcomes by a credentialed professional music therapy requires the minimal triangular relationship amongst the patient the music and the music therapist music therapists hold a minimum of a bachelor's or master's degree in music therapy from an accredited institution where training includes an extensive number of clinical hours 
acquiring knowledge of musical, clinical, and music therapy foundations. Emerging evidence shows that music therapy and musical stimulation can help with stabilization of infant physiologic indicators, such as heart rate, respiratory rate, and oxygen saturation. Music therapy and musical stimulation can also help to reduce infant stress levels and promote better parent-infant bonding and interactions. For parents, music therapy can provide a space to address difficult emotions they may be feeling while their baby is in the NICU. The music therapist can support and care for parents' emotional needs as well as provide them with some guidance in recognizing levels of engagement cues through infant-led musical interactions for increased bonding between parent and baby. I want to show you a video of some metronyms. Isn't that amazing? They start off with different rhythms, but eventually synchronize. This is the process of entrainment. If metals can do this, what more the human condition? Music is hardwired in the brain. Entrainment can be described as neural responses synchronizing to an external rhythm. Listen to this. You are my sunshine, my only sunshine. You make me happy when skies are gray. You'll never know, dear, how much I love you. Please don't take my sunshine away. What did you notice? Was your body swaying as the music slowed down? Did you notice your foot tapping during the catchy section of the music? Or maybe you were even nodding your head. Music can influence our state, our movements, our breathing, our mood, and even the way we perceive time and space. We must remember Music is not a mechanical thing. It is holistic, and it is important that music therapists practice in a family-centered approach in the NICU. Music therapists use music to help improve infant clinical and developmental outcomes, along with supporting parents to navigate any stresses and anxieties during their inpatient experience. One such family-centered music therapy model is rhythm, breath, and lullaby, centering around the first sounds that every infant hears. This model considers the baby and parents as a unit, along with the environment which they are in. RBL is an evidence-based music therapy model developed in Mount Sinai Beth Israel Hospital, New York by Dr. Joanne Lowy and her team. It is currently practiced internationally in over 13 countries, including KKH Singapore. Let's go through the various prongs section by section. For the application of environmental music therapy, EMT, music therapists are trained to play live music with the intention to frame the sound environment to be comforting, soothing, and nourishing. The music is to be played with the environment rather than to it. EMT has been found to help people in the environment feel more relaxed and improve social interaction amongst patients, caregivers, and staff, especially when familiar music is being played by the music therapist. The music therapist assesses the environment to see how to best respond musically. Musical elements like the key of bells and alarms of machines are matched. Soothing, familiar music is played in order to modulate the atmosphere of the environment 
dynamically developing and harmonizing relationships based on needs in the environment. In a study that compared music therapists who provided EMT and performing musicians who provided environmental music, EM, in the hospital, both groups felt that they value added the environment, especially in the area of helping to improve emotional states such as anxiety and stress of individuals. Music therapists were however more focused on treatment goals when providing EMT. Engaging a music therapist to provide EMT as opposed to a performing musician providing EM can lead to a more developed treatment plan and deeper work for the people in the environment where need may arise. The recommendation is for music therapists and musicians to collaborate for the provision of music in the hospital environment. Musicians are trained to perform to an audience. Music therapists assess and play appropriately with the environment. This subtle difference can also have an impact between creating music or noise. In our next prong, we look towards music therapy specifically for the premature baby. Our BL emphasizes on the entrainment of infants' immediate vital rhythms with their first sounds. This includes voices of their parents, breath, and heartbeat sounds. The singing of a familiar lullaby or making whoosh sounds like that of the womb are beneficial in helping the infant have improved regulation and comfort. Here is a video of the music therapist engaging a premature baby using entrainment of first sounds such as the womb sound and a lullaby called Twinkle Little Star. Wasn't that little smile so cute? <laughs> Live music is important for this population as it allows us to respond in the immediacy of the baby's needs. We can instinctively sing faster, slower, louder, softer, based on the baby's cues. No recorded music can do that. Moving forward to the parent-baby diet. Parents are guided by the music therapist to use familiar sounds and lullabies to regulate and connect with their baby. Encouraging parents to sing to their babies also provides a structured way to interact with their babies, especially for parents who may not know what to say or do with their baby. The act of singing also helps parents to feel better, feel more grounded, allowing them to better attune to their baby with and without the music. Let's turn our focus to a video example.
she likes it. She does. Looks like she does. You're happy? Listen to all those beeps and bells. Not the most nurturing of environments. But with the support and assurance of the music therapist, a beautiful lullaby was able to be shared between mother and child, with mother being able to express to her baby that she was so precious to her. The music therapist's role is to create musical moments optimal for parent-baby bonding and to guide parents to use music strategies that can help enhance parent-infant interaction based on baby's gradual or sudden changing needs. Finally, music therapy for parents of babies in the NICU. Imagine you are a parent of a premature baby. You are overwhelmed with information and fear of how your baby might fare in the days to come. Let's turn our focus to the music, try to relax and release the tensions in our body. You may close your eyes or focus on a spot. Just breathe. Allow yourself to fully experience the sensations from the music. Breathing in and out, breathing in, breathing out, two, three, four, breathing in and out, two, three, four, breathing in. I hear babies cry We'll watch them grow They'll learn much more Than we'll ever know And we'll think to ourselves what a wonderful world yes we'll think to ourselves it's still a wonderful world A strategy such as this can help to recenter an anxious parent and bring them into a space where they can be more open to discussing their inner feelings or things pertinent to their baby's care. To close, we know that not every hospital has a music therapist and hiring one might not be feasible. So, I would like to highlight a few points to consider if there is a desire to use music in the NICU in the case where there is no music therapist present. Firstly, the most common form of music that healthcare professionals turn to is recorded music. We know that live music is best used for premature babies to meet their direct needs. However, the use of recorded music does have its place. I would recommend instrumental lullabies to be played at a soft volume and not for a prolonged duration of the day. This is to avoid overstimulating the vulnerable infants. After all, too much sound becomes noise. Finally, a reminder that emotional sensitivity is required when providing music to this population. Not every parent wants to have music for themselves or their baby, and some may not be in a state where they are ready for music. As much as music can comfort, Music is also a powerful tool that can rouse unwanted emotions. 
A music therapist is trained to work psychotherapeutically with vulnerable populations. As such, close supervision should be rendered to whoever seeks to provide music in the NICU to avoid harming rather than helping our premature infants and their families. With that, I thank you all for your attention and I wish you a pleasant day. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you very much for the very enlightening talk, the Miss Miss Kayla. This is kind of new for us. And we still have our poll question uh, for the participants. Which of the statements are, are true? The A, the application of music is always good for premature babies and their families. Recorded music can replace live music for premature babies and their families. C, music when applied to premature babies and their families should be evidence-based and involve a music therapist. And D, music should be used to bring up difficult emotion in parents and premature babies. You have 30 seconds to answer. And I think uh, we are all uh, lullaby with your, with your sing, uh, Miss Kayla. <laughs> okay. So this here is the answer. What do you... What is your opinion, Ms. Kela? All right. Thank you, Dr. Adi. So um, as these questions are a little bit tricky because some of them are half true and not totally true, but the, the answer is actually C, that music when applied to premature babies and their families should be evidence-based and preferably involve a music therapist, even if it's through consultation. So even if you have a nurse or a doctor who's the champion of using music at the NICU, you know, if there was a discussion or some consultation for music therapist, that would be great. So the reason why it's not A is music, you know, it might not always be good. You know, sometimes there are contraindications to using music such as overstimulation and things like that. So, um, you know, music therapists, it's not that we try to stop people from using music, but it's more that we want people to be aware of, you know, the harm that music might bring also. Uh, you know, if uh, unaware sometimes. So um, so that's the reason why uh, C is the answer. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Wong. Uh, so I will hand it over to Dr. Anu. Yeah. I think we call this house open for discussion. Uh, actually, uh, Dr. Teddy, Dr. Andy, and uh, myself, we thought we'll have a small case discussion, but I guess we have had a lot of them have been said as well uh, and I think short of time so I I mean I just want to thank everybody who's been part of this like extremely wholesome one and a half hours of uh, uh, listening from, to, from uh, great minds and also I should really thank Ella who made it so much more relaxing for all of us today I do hope I mean and and uh, the audience, the speakers, all of you who have taken time in your busy schedules and have joined the webinar. Uh, if there are any like any questions which need to be answered, like please go ahead and uh, it's it's to the speakers. If anybody wants to answer any questions, like please go ahead. Do we, do we have any uh, question that we we want to answer live from the Q&A, Dr. Anu? I'm just going through the questions, Dr. Eri. Okay. So, uh, there was uh, a couple of questions around, uh, interestingly about CDH and the role of a regional in congenital diaphragmatic hernia. Uh, so most of the cases with CDH can be unstable, uh, preoperatively come intubated, likely to go intubated, and they may spend some time uh, in the ventilator, even up to four or five days. There is also something called honeymoon period, but they may even succumb to those um, relentless by hypertension. So when we say, well, 
older cardly threaded catheter for those kids. We're talking about very, very selective group of patients who are uh, fairly stable, who are not on inotropes, and are very unlikely to be kept on ventilator for more than 48 or 72 hours. I think that answers a couple of people have asked the, exactly the same question, sir. Yeah, uh, I, I read the questions about the leak for the epidurals. Oh, what is your your tips for that? For to prevent the leak for uh, epidural, what what I do is I I insert like the uh, to the skin. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, what um... do you think? Yeah, the, this is a common problem. The problem is because the needle size related to the catheter size difference, that means there is a track along where the needle went that is going to leak. Um, so there's no uh, shorter distance between the epidural space and the skin. Those are the two reasons why it leaks. Some people have put in something called dermabond. I don't know whether it's available elsewhere, but it just seals, uh, seals the skin um, puncture site doesn't mean that it's not probably still leaking the subcutaneous tissue. The thing you're talking about tunneling helps as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Making a yes, separate tunneling. skin puncture tunneling. Yeah, both are both are good options. But there is no uh, there is no uh, magic solution to this. The palm common problem we all face. Yes, leaking epidural is a common problem. Yeah, the people. Have, I mean, increasingly we are putting some dermabond on the skin side. Okay. There is one question from Ms. Kayla. They uh, want to know about uh, listening to. Oh, where did it go now? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. What about music, which is generally pay, played at SPAs, which is a waves, rains, and streams, etc.? Is it important to have a human voice to it? And do you think it's better to have a recorded mom or dad's voice singing? Yes, uh, thank you for this question. So yeah, some people think music at spas is relaxing, right? Why don't we use that? But you know, the whole point of using uh, human voice, as we say, and importantly, we want parents to use their voice, right? Mother and father's voice, because it is a familiar sound, right? The baby recognizes their parents' voice. So when they hear that familiar sound, that familiar voice, they tend to relax and calm down a lot more, especially if they've just had a painful procedure or something like that. So parents' voices. So it's not so much of, you know, just a recorded music playing, relaxing music, but it's a very intentional use of music. Thanks. Yeah, in, in my, my country is like a Muslim country. Uh, what if we use like a Quran reciting? Can we use that? Yes, so I've actually just uh, replied that question online and thanks for bringing that up because that's very important actually. We want to be very culturally sensitive. So in music therapist practice, you know, always make sure that you know, the parents are okay with us using music for their babies. There are some of our Muslim patients, they do not want music and that's okay. That's really, really okay. Um, you know, we, we encourage them to read the Quran to your baby, um, you know, say your prayers to, uh, you know, with your voice. So your baby still hears your voice. So it's not about using the record. It's about using your voice. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Adik, I have a question for you, if it's okay. Regarding non-pharmacological techniques in neonates, what's your opinion about how useful are they in children in uh, neonates who are actually ventilated? On the ventilator, maybe they just say some sedation. Uh, does it... Actually, they're useful for only for uh, mild to moderate pain. Not for the babies who are on uh, mechanical. On mechanical ventilated babies, one can try... Uh, oral sucrose solution. That is the only feasible option. In the institutes which offer kangaroo mother care in the intubated babies, they can try KMC as well. Uh, but oral sucrose solution is the one which uh, one can try if the baby is uh, very much agitated. Mm -hmm. Okay. So oral sucrose solution, even if the child is like, it's probably sedated, but... Uh, Routinely, we don't use mechanical uh, ventilation or uh, analgesia in, in neonatal ventilation. As a routine thing, we don't use the uh, post-operative cases or babies with uh, uh, severe PPHN we use as a, a routine uh, analgesia. Otherwise, routinely, we don't use uh, sedation in neonatal ventilation. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Okay. And for Dr. Rao, uh, how, how do we start uh, sedation for the, the uh, neonates in the NICU? 
I mean, like uh, the case with Doctor Doctor Jedi uh, yeah. talk about the congenital hernia diaphragm. Before that, we insert the patient into NICU first, and then they come to the OR and how to sedate the patient before the surgery. Yeah. So the, the role of uh, uh, pharmacological sedation, apart from what uh, Dr. Pratik has spoken, non-sedative or non-pharmacological means um, are quite, uh, you know, you have to be judicious about its use. <clears throat> so for example, there are a few instances where we would always consider. Uh, one is your uh, pre-anesthetic, uh, pre uh, pre oh, sorry, um, a pre-intubation uh, pre drug. Uh, and hence, as a, uh, as a cocktail, one of the part of it is usually we use a sedative and analgesic. Uh, in our, our center, we use uh, fentanyl as a choice, uh, where sedation should always be considered or uh, effective uh, analgesia should always be considered. The second instance where we do consider sedation and analgesia is those with the mechanical ventilated babies. And exactly as what uh, uh, the it's not a uniform or routine practice. In fact, the, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence in UK NICE recommends that we don't uh, do it as an umbrella approach for all ventilated babies, but we use it in instance as an adjunct to ventilation. When you need to optimize ventilation, when you have significant dyssynchrony with ventilation, or when you when you have instances where you feel like the the baby needs to be kept uh, sedated and to achieve the goals of ventilation. Say, for example a baby about to be transferred elsewhere where you can't uh, you know, afford to have extubation during transport and hence sedation analgesia becomes the goal uh, for these instances. Uh, and for uh, the, the third instance where sedation analgesia does come into play is, or does come in uh, significance is for the perioperative management. So intraop and postoperative management, uh, not just invasive, but also we also use it for instances like uh, laser therapy for ROP or, you know, in uh, any uh, monoclonal antibodies or uh, including uh, GI surgeries, which are commonly undertaken in perioperative cardiac analgesia. And in these instances, the, mo the most commonly used uh, choice is opioids and uh, morphin. Um, and I know I do sound like, you know, morphin is the agent, but I I'm completely aware in some countries and in some instances that, for example, I was in India last year speaking at the Neocon, where people express often is available uh, in all the units at all, and it requires stringent levels of you know uh, moderation by drug control agencies. Um, and but but MOF is the preferred choice in uh, uh, perioperative management, uh, whilst closely monitoring its uh, side side effects, toxicity, and efficacy and get off. I hope I yeah. answered the question. Okay, my, my concern is about the bowel motility for yeah. uh, when we give morphine. I mean, yeah. could it make uh, the the hernia worse uh, because we like, and then the motility is not good and then yeah. become distended? You're, you're so, right. I mean, you're, you're worried about uh, bowel dysmotility giving, by giving morphine and of course uh, delaying uh, the feeding progression, but uh, that, that is usually encountered when it's in, used indiscriminately or with used un, injudiciously. So if used judiciously for to achieve, the goal here is the pain and sedation relief. And once that's achieved, and by the time the baby is switched over, we often have uh, post uh, GI surgeries, gastroschisis, or even uh, uh, you know, post uh, uh, CDH repair uh, or post uh, esophageal fistula repair, uh, where uh, morphine has been weaned and the feeding has progressed uh, uh, equally, you know, without much delay. Um, but that, that's, that's you know, defining its use, defining your goal of your success is important uh, and closely monitoring and taking it off quickly. Okay, thank you, Dr. Rao. So I will put it back to Dr. Anu. Yeah, like, thanks everybody. Thanks so much for all this active participation and the audience and speakers and everybody. I um, I think we're definitely running short of time. I would just say, uh, just run through this. So a certificate of attendance will be provided. We have a recording that is available and you can always go back and uh, look at our website on either uh, ASPA on face Facebook or the YouTube and uh, support us uh, and join the ASPA group. A uh, lot of education, a lot of going on associated with WSA as well. And uh, this is regarding our next webinar, which is going to be held on 18th of February. 
This is how safe is the child under your care. There's a QR code. You can scan the code for, for uh, registration. And uh, this is there's also a slide about our next uh, live in-person conference, which is going to be held in uh, uh, Malaysia. Uh, so I think I'd just like to wrap up saying that, you know, thank you again. We look forward to your valuable feedback and suggestions as to how we can improve our webinar content and quality again. Quality. So thanks so much for uh, all of you uh, for having come here and spent time with us. Thank you a lot. Thank you for speaking as well. And there were very excellent talks all around. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone.